welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is a series entitled I'm part of a cryptid intervention task force. Without further ado, let's get straight into that. There's lots of dark things in this world that many people don't know about. These things don't care about us. They don't care about our lives. To them, we're just pests running around in their land. You see, I'm part of a cryptid task force. We're pretty well funded and had the best gear and training money can buy. A lot of guys here are former tier one operators from all over the world. Some SAS, some MARSOC, Delta, PJ, Spetsnaz. You get the idea. Our job is to be the wall that separates their world from ours. We get deployed to various areas where there is a surge in cryptid activity. The number of missing hikers or campers spiking, we get sent in. Strange sightings, we investigate. More often than not, our encounters are to neutralize the threat above all else. And trust me, we've adopted a pretty simple yet catchy motto here. Nothing bullets cannot cure. Now, I'm going to be straight up. I do not recommend anyone to go hunting for these things. This isn't a movie or a TV show. These things will kill you, eat you, and shit you out without hesitation. You do not know how many wannabe cryptid hunters we've had to scrape up while we're dealing with an active target. Also, just as a side note, being in this task force doesn't mean you get to encounter every single cryptid. There's many I haven't engaged that other teams have had the fate of dealing with. Now, it's a little about me. Spent some time in Force Recon. Been around the world, seen my fair share of shit and how brutal we as a species can get. And trust me, that shit stays with you. After I did my time, I decided to get into private contracting. One thing led to another, and through word of mouth, I ended up in this outfit. Onto what I feel many of you are waiting for. Where I'm stationed at the moment. The main groups I deal with are werewolves and stag deer people. Lately, these groups have been quiet. With the deer people being the most peaceful of the two. The werewolves, we've been able to create a set of boundaries with them. You see, the werewolves themselves were not transformed. Are off the grid type of individuals. They told us they would keep themselves to themselves and help police their own if any try to cross that line. Lately though, we're hearing that they've been having sightings of large bipedal creatures skulking the outskirts of towns bordering the forest. Missing persons and even one story from a family to the local PD about how their children witnessed their father being dragged away by the dog people. We decided to pay the local alphas a visit. It was an eight-man team, with a platoon-sized force on standby as QRF in case the proverbial shit hit the fan. We loaded up into the M wrap and drove off into the forest. It was a quiet ride, save for the occasional story or joke being tossed around. I myself was nodding off and catching up on some extra hours of sleep before nudged awake by the feeling of the vehicle coming to a stop. The hatch opened and we all moved out and set up a perimeter. We were in front of the makeshift shanty town, made out of abandoned RVs and mobile homes. As we approached them, we spotted movement through one of the windows. A CO told us to stand down and walked forward with his hands up. He only took ten steps before a man, built like Arnold Schwarzenegger from Predator, stepped out from one of the mobile homes. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up and my grip on my weapon tightened. The air was filled with tension as we watched our commanding officer look up at this giant and then laugh. The man laughed as well and they embraced each other with a firm handshake with an audible How have you been you bastard being heard. I relaxed a bit as did the rest of the team. The man beckoned us all closer with our CO nodding that it was all clear. We found out that apparently they have been a pack of younger werewolves running about, 
causing havoc and disturbing the peace of the general area and trying to gain strength, which connects them to the string of missing individuals. We reported back to base and we, along with three other teams, were tasked with a SAR op deep into the PAX territory. Our secondary objective was to subdue or neutralise the younger pack. Now, to be honest, I was hoping to talk these guys down, but knowing that this pack was filled with hotheads trying to make a name for themselves as the new big bad on the block, I doubt we were going to be able to do that. At 17.45 hours, we moved out, pushing past the boundaries placed by the treaty some years ago. It was unnerving to say the least. Don't get me wrong. We are all solid guys, each seeing our share of chaos and brutality that would swallow up the soul of a regular individual. But this, this was something storming an insurgent stronghold or securing a VIP. One wrong move and the entire op could go tits up and a lot of good men would die. That's when our vehicle got hit. MRAPs are designed to take IEDs like a champ and keep rolling until the occupants are out of the kill zone. But I don't think they accounted for the factor of nearly 300 pounds of pure muscle slamming into it at 35 to 50 miles per hour. It sent our vehicle tumbling onto its side and me hanging on for dear life. In the initial days of recovering from the impact, I heard the metal on the back door straining, then saw it come flying right off. The beast then peeked its head in and eyed all of us as if picking from a large buffet table. Its bright yellow eyes locked onto mine as I froze. I couldn't bring my weapon up, nor could I call out. All I could do is lay there as this hulking monstrosity reached for me. Gunfire rang out and I saw the impact of three rounds into its lower abdomen. It howled and stumbled back. Our CO had his sidearm out and pumped the last seven rounds into its upper chest and face. It fell onto the dirt road, writhing in pain, smoke visibly coming out of the entry points. Fun fact, our rounds are silver tipped, and for our sidearms, silver tipped hollow points filled with holy ash. We exited the vehicle and watched as our commander, I'll call him Conrad, dispatched the bastard with two rounds from his rifle to the dome. That's when the gunfire started rigging out in the distance, and the howls, the radio in the MRAP came to life with a frantic voice on the net. This is Wolfpack 36 to Apache Flight. Confirm, call sign. Wolfpack 36, this is Black Raven, over. Solid copy, Black Raven. Request air support at these coordinates. All units in the area, message follows. Nirvana, I say it again, Nirvana. Damn it, Black Raven, we need support. Copy that, coming in hot. They're closing! Oh God! Oh God! No! Jesus Christ! Shoot! The gunfire reached a crescendo, only to be drowned out by the sound of hellfire impact in the area. We sat there in stunned silence, looking at one another before Conrad interjected. So I hand that this is Hunter actual. All bodies accounted for. We still Oscar Mike to objective. How copy? So I handed Hunter so Zweihander to hunt to Axel. Solid copy on all. Be advised, Wolfpack is down. Rendezvous with Eagle and Dragoon three clicks from your position. <coughs> Solid copy, Zweihander. Hunter, Axel, out. <coughs> Conrad looked at us all. Keep your head on a swivel, boys. We're in their country now. Needless to say, the Hellfire probably helped our rendezvous with Eagle and Dragoon more than anything. After grouping up into a sizeable force, we pushed forward, locating their lair of the pack. They were holed up in a cave with makeshift barricades around the entrance. We set up positions around it. Our COs drawing up a plan to neutralise the hostiles and hopefully save any of the missing people taken over the past week if they weren't turned. That's when we saw someone walk out. He looked no older than 19. But he walked as if he was better than us. He stood at the entrance, with several others coming up behind him. He called out to us. Alright, we know why you're here, and trust me, you don't want to fuck with us. We can take out all of you easily. 
There's more of us than you in here. Too many bodies for your bullets. As per protocol, our retort was for him and his compatriots to stand down, come in for questioning and judgment by the elder alphas and to release anyone they held captive. The look on the kid's face was one of disgust and contempt as we bruised his ego. He flipped us off and crouched down on all fours and began to transform. Fucking idiot, I thought. Before he could even finish, a shot rang out. A silver tip 7.62 51mm round impacted his forehead, splitting it like a watermelon. The silence that followed was unnerving. The other individuals looked at his body, then at us, and dropped to their knees, hands in the air. Conrad looked at me, motioning for me and several others to move in, secure and search the compound. I got up and moved, my rifle levelled and ready, moving swiftly towards them. Heel to toe. Heel to toe. I got a good look at them. All kids. Some were crying. Others were shocked into silence as we zip-tied them. After they were secured, we moved into the cave itself. I tossed a flare in, shouting out, CRT! Anyone in here? We got a response, albeit a weak one. We moved to the sound and found our missing individuals. All eight of them. Five males, three females, all obviously shook up and in need of aid. We moved them out onto the waiting MRAPs heading back to base. From what we gathered, we killed the head honcho of the pack and their strongest members were taken out by the hellfire. The survivors were questioned. All said that the kidnapped individuals were set to be turned and added to their numbers. We recovered the bodies of Wolfpack and gave them to the burial. We recovered the bodies of Wolfpack and gave them the burial they deserved. That's all I can say for now. I've got to go. We've got reports of something big happening and Command needs all hands on deck. Take care, all of you. And remember, nothing bullets can't cure. Part 2 I'm part of a cryptid intervention task force. Let's get straight into that. Hey all, I hope everyone has been well and safe since my last post. Boy, do I have a story to tell. Did I ever mention how much I hate wannabe cryptid hunters? You know the type. They read about cryptids on forums, watch a bunch of online videos and then decide, hey, I'm going to go out with my hunting rifle and hunt one down. I'm a badass. Yeah. Those guys. I remember telling you all we had something big going down. It was a clusterfuck. Now let me get down to the details. The perimeter guards caught one of the deer people coming towards our compound. It wasn't uncommon. They would pass by, interact with us and quietly go on about their business. Only this time, it was carrying a bundle in its arms. The guard slowly strode up to it, then quickly radioed in to command about her find. Apparently, the bundle was its offspring, dead from a gunshot wound. The deer people are a very neutral group. They stay in heavy isolation at times, often nervous and wary of humans. It took us quite some time to build up a bond with them. They understand our language, which helps immensely with communication and peaceful relocation when they wander off too far. From what was described to us, its child was simply exploring its surroundings, albeit a bit far from the habitat but the herd was close in case anything happened. According to the head of the herd, the air smelt wrong, as if an outsider had arrived. But before he could figure out what was happening, a shot rang out. He and several other males made their way fast as they could to the area where the sound originated from and found two humans standing over their child. The humans in question fled the scene when they saw the large group of deer people congregating. They came to us immediately, hoping we could find the humans that did this. The base commander, callsign Zweihander, sent them on their way and reached out to the local contracts he had. What was relayed back to us was concerning, to say the least. Apparently, there was a large group of hunters coming through, and the other day, two were seen muttering about how they'd found a herd of Wendigos. Since then, the group decided to pack up and move. We've launched a UAV to scout the area, 
and found a large heat signature deep in the forest. Upon closer examination, we found a makeshift encampment, complete with barricades and fighting positions. We mobilised ASAP with Hunter Team, my group, taking point. We inserted four clicks from the encampment and moved in on foot under the cover of darkness. Our objective was to recon the area, observe and if possible impede the group's operation capabilities. As we neared the encampment, the smell of fresh blood filled the air. Conrad held up his fist and we crouched down. Ahead of us was the hunter encampment, but there was no noise, no bustle of activity whatsoever. He opened his palm and slowly gestured forward. And, as one, we slowly approached the camp. As we got closer, it became more apparent as to what happened. There were body parts everywhere. Spent shell casings, splatters of blood on barricades, vehicles and the grass. It was a massacre. We found out examining everything. We noticed the scattered piles of shell casings meant they were firing in all directions with no clear target. I was confused. This was far from werewolf territory and the deer people were nowhere near this area and are completely peaceful. I looked at Conrad who just stood there looking at it all. I could tell the gears were turning in his head, trying to make sense of this. I was trying as well, but I couldn't shake the feeling in the air, the feeling like we didn't belong, the sense of primal dread gnawing at my very soul. I was shaken out of my trance by Conrad barking orders at us to form up and set up a defensive perimeter. He was frantic, pacing up and down like a madman. He cupped the side of his handset and started to halfway speak and shout. I never saw this stoic leader of mine lose his call before, like he did now. Zweihander! This is Hunter! Axel! Be advised! Alan Quinn! All units on the net message follows! Alan Quinn! Alan Quinn! My blood ran cold. My heart stopped. Alan Quinn was a code word for Wendigo. Command ran us through the rumours of Wendigo sightings and even beefed up our patrols. But we didn't find anything. In the corner of my eye, I saw a flash of movement. I turned and levelled my rifle, focusing on the tree far from the encampment. I cocked my head to the side, then back up, noticing a pair of red eyes. Contact! Contact! I yelled, flipping the safety off my rifle and opened fire. Backing up, the rounds impacted the tree, the third hitting the creature behind the tree, causing it to howl. The area came alive with gunfire as several Wendigos broke through the tree line. The red eyes, the rotten antlers, the emaciated frames. It was a scene of nightmares. They got closer to our position. We were able to drop three of them, but the fourth broke through our position. The Wendigo thrashed around grabbing one of the teammates and tossing them up in the air and batting them away. They died on impact. The hit from the Wendigo breaking their spine. I levelled my rifle and fired. The rounds impacting the Wendigo's skull. The creature collapsed and we immediately set fire to the bodies. The QRF came in immediately with a clean-up crew collecting the remains of the victims, breaking down the camp and cleaning away the blood. I looked to the side, seeing my teammate. His name was Malcolm, being gingerly picked up from where he was thrown by the Wendigo. They placed him on a stretcher and covered his body, slowly carrying him off. The ride back to base was silent. We lost a good man that night, all because a bunch of idiots decided to meddle with a world they do not understand. But one thing concerned us and command. There were actual Wendigos in our area. Something was different. Their patterns were changing, a full investigation was being put underway and the base was set on the highest of alert levels since I'd been stationed there. Things are changing out here and we need to find out what is going on before the situation escalates out of hand. That's all I can say for now. I'm heading out on patrol now. I'll relay any updates when I get back. Take care, all of you. Nothing. Bullets cannot cure. Part 3 in the story and series entitled I'm part of a cryptid intervention task force. Let's 
get straight into that. So, let's cut to the chase. Command is on high alert now, more than ever. We have a UAVs in the air at a constant cycle now, monitoring everywhere. Close commo with the other bases and beefed up patrols. Things are crazy and tense. But on another note, we've got a new guy to replace Malcolm. For any of you who are questioning who Malcolm is, read the previous post. The link is above. So, let me get some details about this guy out here. For privacy reasons, I'm going to stereotypically call him Rook, since he's the new guy on the block. Rook was in the Rangers, did four tours in Afghanistan, apparently. He was in country when I was in there as well. He's kind of wound tight, a bit of a hard ass. So breaking him into how things work here is going to be a challenge to say the least. Especially with how we treat certain populations. You see, when you're briefed into this job, you are told to be the wall to protect the innocent from the evil that goes bump in the night. When you get stationed here and meet these beings though, you realise you have to build a bond with them and that some of them just want to live in peace and isolation. It took some time, but we've built a very healthy system here. It takes new guys some time to adjust, but after a few patrols, they get the idea and keep up with how we operate. I hoped that this would be the case with Rook. I really did. I ended up being the guy to meet him at the landing pad. The CH-47 landed, the ramp lowered, and the bodies spilled out. Fresh recruits to replace our losses. I saw him, close cut hair, that walk of purpose. I extended my hand. Welcome, I'm part of the Hunter team, your new outfit. He looked at me and gripped my hand with a firm shake. Glad to be here and to be of service. What can you tell me about the area? He glanced all over, observing the air crews as they rushed to refuel the Chinook and whatever other aircraft decided to land. I looked at him and gestured to the bunker itself. Well, we've got the werewolves and their lot in the shantytown up north, the deer people to the east and the Sasquatch tribes to the west. I glanced at him as he nodded, taking in the information. Once we entered the base, I took him to our communal quarters, showing him his bunk. Look, Rook, we've got a system here with all of these groups. A system that works and benefits all of us. Just, just follow the orders of our CO. Do your job and we will make it home alive and with our limbs attached. Got it? He nodded at me, dropping his duffel bag next to his bunk. I got it. When is the unit heading out? He sat down, looking up at me as two guys ran down the hallway putting on their gear. We've got a patrol up north in a few hours. Have to reach out to the shanty town about a sighting reported the other day. Simple and to the point. Rook nodded at me. And we left it like that. A few hours later, we gear up and head out, reaching the shanty town. We unloaded and calmly walked in. Dressed down for the op, we usually roll out in full operator gear, but due to the relationship with the shanty town, we were just in our combat gear minus the combat shirt. So, a regular t-shirt under our plate carriers. I nodded and waved at familiar faces, with Conrad making his way to where the alphas are. He greets them and sits down, starting conversation, leaving us to interact with the locals and monitor the area. Everyone was calm, save for Rook. He stood there, eyeing everyone. I knew his body language all too well, the same way you'd watch an area in Afghanistan, always waiting for something to pop off. The locals sensed his unease as well, keeping their distance from him. One thing led to another and the next thing we know, commotion near one of the RVs with Rook zip-tying a man in front of his family. The kids are crying and the wife shoves them inside him again to growling. The husband is pleading with the wife but she doesn't listen. Rook is now backing up, aiming at her with his rifle, 
telling her to stand down at a fever pitch. He's freaking out as he's watching her turn into a werewolf form. Shit was about to hit the fan and no one stepped in. I sprint for it, getting between the two. I know the family very well. The kids come and run around the M-Raps when we pass by. I call her by her name, pleading with her to calm down. She's fully transformed by now and stomps towards me. I'm calm, but Rook is freaking out and shaking. She sniffs me and snarls, slowly reverting to her human form. Everyone is watching now, even the Alphas. Conrad is with them, his eyes hidden under a pair of aviators, but I know he's pissed. I untie the husband and apologise. He smiles and pats me on the shoulder, understanding and rushing inside. I turn to Rook and grab him by his strap on his plate carrier, dragging him up against a nearby tree and landing a right hook across his face. Everyone is watching us in silence. Rook shoves me, asking me what my issue is. I explain to him that these people are no threat, that they respect our boundaries, that they just want to live in peace. He retorts that our job is to protect humanity. I grab him again, my gloved hands around his throat now. It takes a couple of guys to tear me off of him. The ride back to base is tense, with everyone silent. As we arrive, Conrad pulls Rook to the side, speaking to him, explaining to him that his stunt could have escalated the situation and caused the deaths of many individuals at the shantytown. We ended up being called into briefing soon after. Command found where the Wendigos had been migrating from. We are being mobilised with an armoured and aviation task force to intercept and destroy them. Are we out for a bit? This is a big operation. I'll try to relay as soon as I get back. Stay safe, everyone. Remember, nothing, bullets, cannot cure. I'm part of a cryptid intervention task force. Part four. Let's get straight into that. Hey everyone, I'm back. It's been a good couple of days and I can explain where I've been. We took the fight to them. It was a major operation and we took them out. Command found out where the stream of Wendigos was coming from and we brought the pain. We were given an armoured air task force to assist with dealing with the threat as just sending ground troops would basically be free food for them. Let's get on to the meat of my report for you all. Command was contacted by one of our sister bases deep up north, near the Canadian border. Apparently, their drones found the telltale signs of Wenigo's encroaching in the area. Knowing that we were dealing with a small group pushing southward towards us, they asked if we were willing to participate in a joint SAR destruction operation on the Wendigo threat. Zweihander decided to send a large response force up north, which I was a part of. We would meet up with the other base's forces, along with heavy armour and air cover, and push into the Wendigo territory and annihilate them. While also keeping eye on our civilians in our AO to evacuate or rescue. Command decided to, the operation should start at least in the day as Wendigos have extreme advantages at night. So, my unit packed up when we moved up north for the past few days. Our ground convey was bigger, with us replacing our MRAPs for strikers and LAVs. This gave us added protection and firepower, as the strikers were equipped with their standard 30mm cannon, and the LAVs were equipped with 30mm cannons fitted with incendiary rounds and a flamethrower. Our air cover comprised of a flight of Apaches and Cobras. Their call signs were Black Raven and Roaring Dragon. On the ground, it was my unit, Hunter. Dragoon, Eagle, Reaver, Echo, Griffin, Hitman Assassin and Oddball. We linked up with five other teams. Call sign, Toolbox, Shogun, Reaper, Talon and Archangel. The initial push into the forest was uneventful, but the deeper we got is when we 
receive contact. It was sporadic at first, as if they were testing us. Random debris would hit the armoured hull of our vehicles, trees would fall, and our gunners would see movement in between the trees. We were all calm, save for Rook, who, under his stoic demeanour that he was putting on, was pissing himself with fear. As much as he was on everyone's shit list for the stunt he pulled, we still had his back, and we hoped he had ours, so we could make it out there alive. Our air cover engaged first, causing the convoy to halt. Apaches and Cobras danced and strafed the tree line, engaging targets at will and destroying their concealment. Plumes of powder white snow flew into the air as 30mm rounds from their chain guns impacted the earth. We heard the howls through the thick plating of the LAV as many rounds found their target. Conrad kept his palm pressed against his headset listening carefully for our cue to engage. I observed everyone. We were all in full combat gear, but our camouflage would clash against the white of the snow, which we didn't mind, allowed us to keep an eye on each other. That and a multicam black worked extremely well on night operations. I grabbed my HK416 tightly, my thumb caressing the area where the safety selector was located. Conrad perked up, and gave us a thumbs up, calling out, All right, Hunter team, time to engage. Let's move out. The cabin came alive with hollers as a ramp lowered, and we quickly filed out and took up fighting positions. The quick, blinding sensation of the sun shining on the white snow flashed into my eyes and was replaced with an almost serene vista. And then the sounds of gunfire, shouts and helicopter blades brought me back to reality. I observed the chaos, moving forward with my units, engaging where we saw fit. I saw them, their gaunt, emaciated frames, striding through the snow effortlessly. Their howls chilled me to the core, but it was briefly, since I saw one fall from an incendiary 30mm round to the chest. I took aim and fired, the recoil kicking gently against my shoulder, my breathing slow and methodical. We kept pushing up under the cover of the air and the armour, pushing them deeper into the forest, closer to their lair. This went on for hours until the moon shined over us. The howls increased as more of them came forth to assist their embattled comrades. I sprinted through the perimeter made by the armoured task force. Vehicles lined up in rows and between each vehicle was a dug-up position where a heavy weapons team was tasked to help hold the line. Tracers filled the night as rounds found their targets and Wendigos burst into flames. I found Conrad, who relayed to me that we were pushing deeper in. I nodded, sprinting to find the others. I found Rook first, helping a heavy weapons team set up, covering them as they planted their M249s into position. He looked at me, nodded, and moved to cover me as soon as, as the gunner team began suppressing and advancing Wendigos. Once everyone was found, we regrouped with Conrad and Shogun team. We moved behind a group of LAVs and strikers as they roared forward, their cannons and flamethrowers lashing out at the enemy in front of them. Flames danced forward and enveloped the arm of one of the Wendigos, who, in a fit of rage, slammed into one of the strikers. The driver backed up quickly, firing away at the beast. More flames enveloped it as it tried to lash out at us behind an LAV. We fired, backing up as well, our rounds slamming into it as it thrashed around. The skin burned away and the muscles melted off the bone as it finally collapsed into the snow in a pile of flame. Another one burst forward from the darkness but was quickly gunned down. We kept moving. Finally, reaching the lair of the beasts, as we approached it, a larger Wendigo sprang forth, holding a makeshift large branch as a club. Judging by its size, we assumed it was an ancient Wendigo, one from centuries in the past. Every vehicle and operator opened fire, all of our rounds impacting it, but it still kept coming. I thrashed around, then tossed its makeshift weapon, it striking the side of one of the LAVs and then slamming into a few of our allies, sending them sprawling. Rook 
and I slowly moved forward, heel to toe, firing and reloading as we went. We would move as one. When I would reload, he would cover me, and I would do the same for him. The beast slowly kept backing up, roaring into the night. Over a radio, we heard the air cover coming in hot. Conrad ordered us to pull back, and we did, leapfrogging back to the safety of our armoured vehicles. The Apaches came in, strafing it with the 30mm, followed by the Cobras firing several TOW missiles at it. Finally, three Apache Hellfires impacted the area, and the LAVs moved up, emptying their tanks for their flamethrowers onto the pile of rubble. We let out the ragged cheer, watching as the flames danced around and swallowed everything whole. This was a good day. A day we would all remember. A day where we took the fight to the darkness and won. Lately, everything has been quiet. No sightings, no incidents, and we are enjoying the current peaceful atmosphere. I'm heading out on patrol in a few hours, going to check up on the Sasquatch tribes. I hope you will stay safe out there. And remember, nothing, bullets, cannot cure. Part 5 and 6 in the series entitled I'm part of a cryptid intervention task force. Without further ado, let's get straight into that. Hey everyone, it's been a while. This past week has been intense. We found out that the rogue cryptid groups aren't the only thing we had to worry about. It was almost cost us dearly. Let me start from the top. We went to check with the Sasquatch tribes. We arrived at the area and stepped out. The Sasquatch people are extremely peaceful and helpful. They directed us to lost hikers, or have even brought us people they saved from certain death in the wild. We communicate with sign language, just as you would with a gorilla. They are an awe to behold in person, I can tell you that much. I exited the MRAP, the crunch of dirt under my boots as I observed the area. We left our weapons in the vehicle, as we usually do when we visit, as the sight of the weapons makes them uncomfortable. Hunters and Bigfoot enthusiasts are to blame. The area was laid out like a small village, simply yet sturdy huts, and the Sasquatch going about their daily routines. We heard a few grunts and hollers towards us. We waved back in kind and walked towards where their leader was. We reached the centre of the small village and the largest one stepped out, standing at a solid nine feet. It was a sight to see. Conrad smiled and began signing. How are you all doing? He asked, looking around the village. Harvest and hunt seem to be very bountiful this season. The leader grunted, signing back, his chest puffed with pride. Season has been very good. Many strong young ones helped. No one bother us. We stay safe and hidden. He then looked at all of us beckoning us to follow him. We trowed behind him, sensing the urgency. We arrived at a large hut and stepped inside. What we found was shocking, to say the least. A whole family, husband, wife, the toddler, an infant, the leader, looked at us and began signing again. We find them running from other humans. Other humans dressed funny, their heads covered, but we sensed they were bad. We waited until night. Bad humans had guns, so we took good humans away from them. Conrad nodded, replying, Thank you so much for doing that. We will take them now. Please stay hidden and safe. We will be looking around the area for these other humans. The leader nodded and huffed, leaving us to collect the family. From what we had gathered on our way back to base was that the family was on a run from an extremist doomsday cult hidden past our patrol areas. We also learned that they are dabbling in the occult and their leader is pushing to open a dimensional rift and unleash beings from the other side and summon the apocalypse. 
I would be lying if I said we thought of this as another day on the job. I've dealt with werewolves, wendigos, even the occasional skinwalker. Another story from when my unit did joint training in the south. But the occult was a different beast. We heard of teams in Europe dealing with the occult. Vampires, ghouls, fairies, necromancers and even fucking dragons. Zweihander knew this and called in a favour from across the ocean. Over the next few days we had an influx of new personnel from the European bases. I was able to talk to some of the guys and what I learned had me on the fence. The Europeans were waging a shadow war on every cryptid within their borders, both docile and hostile. While we have a decent relationship with some of the cryptid groups and even made a bond with them, the Europeans have made implementing a scorched earth policy. Nothing lives I have my reservations, but I do understand their cryptid population is completely different in system. I just hope they wouldn't try to alter the structure and system we've worked so hard to maintain here. We were all called to briefing and given our objectives. The cult was holed up in the mountains, stockpiling weapons and supplies for their apocalypse. Our objective was to hit hard and leave nothing standing. We were given new ammunition variants, courtesy of the European teams. The rounds themselves were all blessed by priests, mixed with melted religious artefacts and imbued with holy ash. We were assured that these would deal with the cultists and whatever creatures they were able to summon. We were mobilised and moved out. Several armoured columns followed by air cover and transport. Command was not taking any chances. We also had to use a nearby army base and their artillery pieces if push came to shove. We came under fire as soon as we neared the mountain, mostly small arms from what we could tell. The turrets on our transports opened fire and launched smoke canisters to cover and dismount. We piled out and moved forward, using scattered trees and our vehicles for cover. The air was ripe with the crackle of gunfire and shouts. Overhead, Two Apaches roared overhead, their 30mm cannons strafing the enemy defence's positions. I dropped near a fighting position, cupping my headset, listening closely to the net. Eagle team, taking fire, 11 o'clock. Contact, right side, right side. Set up that 240 now. Dragon team, I need suppressing fire on our left flank now. Set up that MG there. Zyhander, all units be advised European task forces reported cultists are filled in cryptids. Stand by. <coughs> Reaper team, 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock, check your fire. 2-2, two, two, I, I need an SAW to cover that sector or we'll get overrun. <coughs> Echo team, be advised our Mark 19 is down. Our Mark 19 is down. We've got a man down requesting case vac. I was shaken out of my trance by Conrad who motioned for me to move up. I levelled my rifle and followed him up the hill. What I saw had me questioning who we were fighting. I saw the cultists, some dressed in plain clothes, others in ceremonial garbs, and what appeared to be cryptids we never encountered before. These things stood around seven feet, long arms, gaunt frames, horns jutting out of their forehead, black, curled talons on their hands and feet, Dents where their eyes should be, and a long snout filled with rows of razor sharp teeth. We engaged them, our rounds impacting the beasts. The ammo given to us was effective, but not as fast as we'd hoped. It took several shots to take these things down, and they bounded down the hill to our positions fast. The European teams moved up ahead of us with tall rectangular shields, like those of Roman legions only that these shields were covered in what appeared to be explosives. They formed a shield wall between us and the beasts, and a large flash of light emanated from the shields themselves, causing the beasts to fall back. Covered in burns and gaping holes in their bodies, they slowly moved up, inch by inch as we fell in behind them. The cultists fell back into their hideout and we pursued, clearing each room methodically. We finally reached the last chamber which was larger than the others. We found several Sasquatches chained in a row, 
beaten and bleeding, and the last of the cultists facing us along with their leader. The man strode up to us, his arms extended from underneath his robes, his mouth spread ear to ear in a fanatical grin. Welcome, all of you. You are about to witness the cleansing of this world, the rebirth of our very civilizations. He paced by the chained Sasquatches, taking a blade and slitting the throat of one of them, which caused the rest to wail in despair. With the blood of these beasts, we open a portal to our lords, who will help us rid the world of impurities. He glared at us. And all of you. With a flash of red light, a portal opened, and several of the unidentified cryptids stepped out, one of them impaling the leader, who laughed in a crazed glee onto its claws. The beasts charged us, and we engaged. The European teams forming their shield once more, in a flash of light several of the cryptids flew back. Save for two who slammed through the shields, we emptied our magazines into them as they barreled through us, and I felt a strap on my plate carrier. I pulled out my sidearm and frantically shot at what I assumed was its face. The hollow point rounds impact in its skin, tearing chunks of flesh off it. It howled and tossed me across the room, sending me tumbling in a cloud of dust. It felt a sharp pain in my side as I impacted the cave wall, and everything went to black. When I woke up, I was outside behind my team, next to the Sasquatches we found. It was hazy at first, but I slowly got up, feeling a sharp pain in my left arm. I used my rifle as a crutch and got up, levelling it. Everyone was shouting with my team and others from North American base aiming at the Europeans. Rook looked at me, his eyes wide. Bro, you're up. Man, this is shit show. The Euros want to wipe out the Sasquatches we found, but Comrade found out they were taken from one of the tribes and forced into this. The Euros don't buy it and want them dead. Fuck, man, this day just keeps getting better, doesn't it? I gave him a dry laugh. <laughs> I know, right? God, my arm hurts. He chuckled a bit. Got to stop choking the snakes, man. It's bad for you. I rolled my eyes at him. Fuck you, man. He chuckled and flipped me off a quick bird, then returned to our current situation, staring down the barrels of people we were just fighting alongside. Minutes felt like hours as neither of us budged. I looked back at the Sasquatches. They were huddled together, scared. I gave them a gentle nod, hoping that I could assure them they would be safe. Suddenly, one of the European guys held up a hand, then cupped his headset. His body language seemed perplexed, maybe even irritated. He slowly lowered his rifle, motioning for the others to do the same. We lowered ours as well, gesturing for the cryptids to follow us. We loaded them onto our air transport and had them flown to our base. Once we arrived, the Europeans quickly left leaving us some of their gear for us to use. From what I can tell, we won't be seeing much of them anytime soon. Anyway guys, I have to go. Getting called to the briefing room. I'll get back to you all soon. Stay safe, and remember, nothing, bullets, cannot cure. Part 6 I'm part of a cryptid intervention task force. Let's get straight into that. There's been a breach. We've been hit. I, I do not know what the fuck has happened, but it hits us hard. The Council of Alphas are nearly all dead and it's all falling apart around us. The perimeter guns are going loud. As I tell you all this, whatever werewolves that are loyal to our treaty are helping us hold the line. We've requested backup from nearby air bases and are hoping it comes soon. Let me tell you all the rundown of what happened. We were doing our regular patrols. The entire area was as it should be. Even since we got rid of that cult, the usually peace followed. Conrad got a message from the elder pack leader, relaying to us that several packs of younger werewolves broke off just as previous one did a while back. He said they were planning something big 
and that he would relay to us as soon as he figured out what it was that was going on. We relayed the information to Zweihander, who raised the base alert level up to four to account for the number of werewolves on the loose. I sat in the common area, browsing and relaying information to the other bases about the sightings and anomalies. Then Conrad ran through the door, startling all of us. He looked at him and he stared at us, his jaw set. Gear up, we're heading out. Augustus is compromised, he said, turning and heading out. Augustus was the code word for the head alpha of the werewolves. And if he was compromised, that meant the entire power structure of the area would fall into disarray. We geared up, jumped into our MRAP and sped off into the shanty town. While we were en route, Conrad played the recording of what he received. Augustus, hey man, I know you told me you were also looking into this mess. So I decided to relay some information I gathered. I found out who the leader of this insurrection is. Wait, what are you doing here? Several gunshots ring out, an audible thud is heard. Augustus, do not do this. Years of trust, years of kinship will be wiped away. You will bring destruction to our people. Please, I beg you, think of the generations after us. Unknown male. Trust. Kinship. We owe nothing to them humans. They are beneath us. Yet they strut around as if they are one of us, or even worse, above us. We will wipe them from the pages of history, old man. We are in the new worlds now. Single gunshot is heard and transmission cuts off. We all sat there in stunned silence, contemplating what we just heard. I leaned back in my chair, my thumb caressing the fire selection switch on my rifle. I turned my head to the front of the vehicle as I heard our driver call out, Contact! 12 o'clock! Looks like several housing areas are burning. Conrad nodded, then opened the hatch as the vehicle stopped. It was raining as we poured out of the vehicle, the smoke hanging in the air like fog. We set up a perimeter, scanning our sectors, slowly moving out. Rook squeezed my shoulder as he moved past me, whispering, On your six, bud. We barely made it away from the MRAP when the first shots rang out. Two of our guys went down. Conrad started yelling to engage. Howls filled the air as we started to push back to our vehicle and collect our wounded. Several large dark figures darted in and out of the haze. Screams reached a crescendo as our unit was torn into multiple sides. A driver stepped out firing off his shotgun, hitting one of our assailants. My eyes widened as I saw a clawed hand grab him by his helmet. His arms and legs flailed around as he struggled, the beast taking a chunk out of his throat and tossing him and his lifeless body into the mud. I opened fire at the beast, the round stitching its body upward. Two rounds slamming into the jaw and temple. It slumped over and fell off the MRAP. I turned to face outward, firing several bursts at whatever I could see. I heard Conrad yell to regroup near the vehicle. An MRAP holds eight people, driver, passenger, and six in the back. We went in with eight, and from what I could tell, there were only four of us left. We all aimed outward at the darkness, the growls accompanying the soft patter of rainfall around us. The growls turned into snarls, followed by full-on roars, and then whimpers as we heard the splash of feet distance themselves from us. We stood there, our bodies pressed together as we each covered a different sector. Then we heard a voice call out to us. It's okay. It's safe. We looked at each other. I scoffed, Rook muttering. If we're safe, I expect to see some fine-ass Thai girls walking up to us. I let out a dry chuckle. I just want a fucking beer at this point, man. This roused a few more laughs, with someone else chiming in. I hear that. We all accepted that if we were going to die, we were going to die together and take as many of them with us. We heard wet footsteps approaching us. We levelled our rifles towards the sound, and a woman came towards us, her hands up. Her red hair was drenched, as was her jacket. She looked at the scene around us, swearing under her breath. Several werewolves came behind her, carrying some of their men. 
They gingerly placed them near us. Rook checked them all. He made note that they were alive, but barely. We loaded them onto the vehicle, along with our dead. I turned to face the woman and the werewolves with her. She looked at us, flipping her collar up. Not all of us accept this violence. We will join you. It might not be now, but soon we shall join you in this war. She looked around. I'm so sorry for this to happen to you. And with that, she sprinted off into the dark, her compatriots in tow. I hopped into the driver's seat and slammed my foot down on the gas. The vehicle bounded down the road, the rain slamming against the metal body. In front of us was the base. The searchlights were on and the gate itself was shut. It opened slowly and a large group of personnel spilled out, weapons drawn as they waved us in. Howls permeated the air as we got out and the gate slammed shut. They were coming and we did not have long to prepare. Gunners manned towers along with snipers in defensive positions. We were set up around the entrance into our base itself. Our base is built into a mountain akin to the safety bunkers used for nuclear fallout. We had four layers of defence, all leading up to the massive doors that separated the outside world from the intricate layers of our base of operations. Even then, inside had several checkpoints of machine gun teams setting up in case our outer defences fell. I quickly made my way to the armoury, replenishing my ammo and explosives. Rook followed close behind, alongside Conrad and the other survivors of our team. We all nodded at each other and made our way to the outer perimeter. That's when the gunfire began to start up. They were here. We sprinted through the halls and made it outside. The guard towers were alive with gunfire as they engaged the oncoming threats. Several werewolves made it over the wall and we engaged them. Their large but nimble frames bounding towards our defensive line. More bodies continued to climb over as the towers tried to stem the tides. We kept firing at the mass of flesh approaching us. Many fell, but others began approaching our positions. They impacted our positions in mass of claws and teeth. We fought back with bullets, knives and swords. Several of our troops procured melee weapons throughout their time here. Many chose long swords to deal with the wolves, their blades being coated in silver and holy ash. The ensuing melee, I saw one of the guys slam his sword through the chest of one of them. He was subsequently tackled and torn apart. I can still remember his screams and swears as he pulled the pin on one of his grenades and the explosion taking the majority of them with him. We slowly began to drive them back and this allowed us to count our losses and wounded. A lot of good men and women were lost in a span of 60 minutes. As we regrouped, we heard commotion at the gate. Conrad nudged his head in that direction we all made our way to the perimeter. We saw a mass of people huddled by the gate. Men, women and children. In front of them was the same woman that helped us when we were ambushed. She looked at us, her eyes showing sympathy for what was happening. She bowed her head. Please, we have nowhere to go. We are not welcome no longer since we will not participate in this purge. I beg you, I plead that you can find it in your hearts to help us. We looked at each other, then at her, standing in awkward silence for a few moments, until someone shoved through us, muttering, God damn it, man, these kids are freezing, get them in. We snapped out of our trance and rushed them inside the base. Inside guards and medical personnel tended to them alongside our wounded. I looked at the scene and then slowly turned to the line of body bags on the other end of the medical ward. I hung my head and slowly walked past them towards the unit quarters. I changed out of my soaked uniform, treading it for a warm set, sitting down and staring at myself in the mirror. Tonight was going to be a long night. My mind was trying to process what had just happened, and on the radio I heard that reinforcements were being mustered to our area. I don't know how long we can hold out, but we've been told they are massing for another assault. The strongest werewolves of the refugee group have volunteered to help us. And unmanned combat drones have been deployed to assist with defences. I know I am not going to be able to sleep for a while. Take care, everyone. 
I hope you all live full and happy lives. Nothing, bullets, cannot cure. Wow. Hope you guys are enjoying this series as much as me. Absolutely fantastic. Big shout to uh, the author once again, Raven Legionnaire. Uh, fantastic work. Of course, guys, please do let me know down below in the comments. Please do like and share. And remember, above all, be safe, not sorry.